All eyes are right now on the Swedish capital. Leaders and businessmen from around the world have gathered in Stockholm for the 50th anniversary edition of the United Nations Climate Conference. It is a two-day event that started on Thursday and will conclude later today. In late 2021, leaders from around the world had gathered in Glasgow for the COP26 summit. A series of promises were made back then, and as history is proof, they eventually took a back seat. We must be honest that, presented with the best available science over and over again, our leaders have denied and then delayed and for decades shown a cowardly lack of leadership to take action to meet the climate crisis. If this generation of leaders does not act now, and if it doesn't act fast, it will be handing the next generation a world that is broken. The conference will address issues related to action on cutting emissions, the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and how to accelerate environmental protection into development policy. The conference also comes at a time when a war is raging in Eastern Europe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has unfortunately shifted the world's focus from the worsening climate crisis. Countries have stepped back on their promises to phase down carbon emissions. They are burning more coal, digging more seabeds for crude. They say that the reason is the energy crisis triggered by the war. The U.S. climate envoy John Kerry called this out in his address on day one of the meeting. He said that parties cannot use Ukraine as an excuse. Ukraine is now being used as an excuse by people who prefer the status quo over the transition, who are unwilling to recognize that Ukraine is not... If anything, Ukraine is, is, is a message to all of us. This is why you should be energy independent and not allow a petro dictator to hold you hostage because you're so dependent on their fossil fuel. Ahead of the conference, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres also said that the Russia-Ukraine war has shifted the focus from the much needed climate debate. The director of the UN's environment program also flagged the same concern. I understand that the Russian Federation has many grievances, but the UN Charter foresees a large number of mechanisms. There are multiple crises in this world and we cannot just let go of what is an existential crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis and the pollution and waste crisis. Now we understand and have great solidarity with the people who suffer in war, but that must not mean that we do not deal with other matters. This edition of the Stockholm Conference marking 50 years since it was held it commemorates five decades of global environmental action. The first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment was held in 1972. It took place in Stockholm from the 5th to the 16th of June in 1972. And a lot of time has passed since then. The climate crisis was not much talked about in the 1970s. Its impact was not as deadly. But today the world is facing intensifying climate disasters. Efforts to keep carbon emissions under check have failed. Back in 1972, the Stockholm Declaration was released as a result of this conference. The Declaration proclaims truths relating to man and the environment. It is said that man is the creator and molder of his surroundings. The Declaration also reiterated the importance of preservation of the environment. The roots of that conference lie in a 1968 proposal from Sweden. It called on the United Nations to hold an international conference to examine environmental problems and, of course, to tackle those issues that needed international cooperation. The 1972 conference was attended by delegations of 114 governments. However, it was boycotted by the Soviet bloc countries. That was 50 years ago. 
India even then was leading the call for what is now known as climate justice for developing countries. India's then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was the only head of state in attendance. She gave a speech that highlighted the unfairness of the burden that developing countries had carried. While on the one hand, poor countries had to focus on economic growth for the upliftment of the poor, on the other hand, these countries had the same climate targets and restrictions as the developed countries. Countries with but a small fraction of the world's population consume the bulk of the world's production of minerals, fossil fuels, and so on. Thus, we see that when it comes to the depletion of natural resources and environmental pollution, the increase of one inhabitant in an affluent country at his level of living is equivalent to an increase of many Asians, Africans, or Latin Americans at their current material levels of living. The inherent conflict is not between conservation and development, but between environment and the reckless exploitation of man and earth in the name of efficiency. Rich countries including the United States, Canada, Japan and much of Western Europe are responsible for 50% of all the planet warming greenhouse gases that have been released from fossil fuels and the industry over the past 170 years. And these countries account for just 12% of the global population today. On Wednesday, the Stockholm Environment Institute and the Council on Energy, Environment and Water presented a report at the Stockholm Conference after taking stock of the actions that had been taken by the governments globally in the last 50 years. They found that the use of natural resources has more than tripled since 1970, with the benefits of this usage distributed unevenly across the world. And this shows that 50 years later, not much has changed, even as time is running out. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.